Well, let's, let's, let's introduce ourselves. My, my name's Ian Clayton. I, I'm from Featherstone in, in West Yorkshire, and I, I write for, for a living. And this is... My name's Eliza Carthy. I'm a folk singer. I come from Robin Hood's Bay in North Yorkshire, and I mess around with the violin for a living. There you go. <laughs> oh, I think just to, by way of setting a context for what we're going to do, um, I can't pretend that it's like a formal interview because we're mates and it'd be daft to, to try to surprise with any questions. Um, so let's, let's set a context. Uh, I lived at all in the early 1970s and I was in awe of a band called the Watersons who also lived in, in Hull. And um, I was, I'll fast forward to 1977, I, I was on the a platform at Hull Railway Station, there was a, a, a record shop called Shakespeare and Co. And I was rummaging through some cardboard boxes outside the shop on a trestle and I pulled this album out um, and it was a Watersons album called For Pence and Spicy Ale. And this is in 1977 so it's at the height of punk rock and the cover on it I thought was the most punk thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was a, it was a, a collage of English folklore through the ages and I thought what's that I, I must buy that and I did and I took it home and I I just thought this is for me this is it just spoke to me in so many ways and uh, I became a, a fan of the Watersons and I didn't realize it but many years later I was a, a, a presenter on television on Yorkshire television and it fell to me to interview Eliza's mum Norma Waterson and I went and sat around the kitchen table in Robin Hood's Bay and asked her if she'd sing for me and she sang a song called Green Grows the Laurel all 37 verses <laughs> <laughs> and, and blew, blew me away absolutely with the power of a, the wind from her breath and a, a, a voice and I fell in love for the, for the second time with the Watersons and then over the years we'd become friends and I, I, I became friends with Eliza's dad as well and then Eliza and uh, it's been a great journey for me to be on and I thought that we could present that journey to you from Eliza's childhood talking about her family as well so that's what we're going to try and do today but when we we're preparing for it Eliza said well I can sing Green Grows the Laurel <laughs> so, the, the flesh, the goose flesh that came on my arms around her mum's kitchen table will now come to you because she's going to start today with, with that song. Well, it's green grows the laurel And so cold now goes the dew And how sorry was I when I parted from you Just like the rose in the garden When her bloom is all gone Don't you see what I have come to Don't you see what I have come to for staying up late? And it's once I had a colour that was as red as any rose. Ah, but now I'm as pale Sorry was I when I parted from you Just like the rose in the garden When the bloom is all gone Can 
Don't you see what I have come to for loving that man? Now my parents disliked me. They turned me away from the door. So I told them I would ramble like I used to before. And I picked up my baby and I walked out the door. And I told them I would ramble like I used to before. And it's green grows the laurel and so cold now blows the dew. And how sorry was I when I parted from you. Just like the rose in the garden When her bloom is all gone Can't you see what I have come to For loving that man Start. And where do you start? I mean, when Big Bill Brunsey uh, toured Britain in the late 1950s, just before he died, he did one last tour, he, he was a friend of Eliza's mum. A, a, a mum took him for fish and chips at a famous fish and chip restaurant in, in Hull. And then when Bob Dylan came first to England in that bad winter of 1963, he, he sought out Martin Carthy, Eliza's dad, uh, who taught him how to play certain things on, on the Scout guitar. Fair, he, he Lord him, Franklin. Lord Franklin and all them. And Paul Simon, of course, famously nicked the arrangement of Scarborough Fair from, from Martin. Nicked so, is kind of the wrong word for it. Dad taught it to him as well. Yeah, you know. he did. They very much thought of, of traditional music as common property in them days and it was important to pass it around. Mm -hmm. Really, so <coughs> the nicking element didn't really come from Paul Simon, it came from the management, as these things often do. Yes, we'll talk we'll about do. record companies later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the kind of history that we were involved in, deep, deep, important history of music and social history. Um, but let's, let's talk about you, because if you've got a dad called Martin Carthy and a, and a mum called Norma Waterson and you grow up in that environment, is there any chance that you might not be a musician? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I, I grew up in a very large family. We moved to the Robin Hood's Bay area from Hull in 1970, 71. And we moved, first of all, into Whitby and then onto a farm where all three siblings and their families, we all lived next door to each other. George and Lal, uh, George Knight and Lal Waterson and their children, Oliver Knight and, and Mary Waterson moved into the farmhouse. And then Mike and George converted the two barns next door into a house for Mike Waterson and Anne, and their four, and me, and my mum and dad in the end. And I have, you know, I've, I've got 12 or 15 cousins and, and I suppose Ollie and Mary both went into music and I went into music, but the rest of them didn't. So I suppose I didn't think it was inevitable. Looking back, it probably was. <laughs> but I wanted to be originally, well, I wanted, originally I wanted to be a ballerina and a, and a fire person so that I could so that I could put out fires and then dance to cheer people up <laughs> when their houses had burnt down. <laughs> I think I was planning on being a better ballerina than I was a fan. <laughs> but you know after I, after I got over I, the I want to be a unicorn phase I um, 
I wanted to be a writer. Funnily. Yeah. I did. Um, but I think somewhere in there, I, I always wanted to sing. And it was really my relationship with Dad that spurred that on at the end of the day. Although, because my mum and my mum's music was always there. My dad, not so much in the 80s because he was on tour a lot. He was in a couple of very successful bands at the time and he was away. And it wasn't until he started coming back, it wasn't until him and Dave Swarbrick started working together again in about 1988 that I really, really got into it as a whole family thing. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it was inevitable, <laughs> but I didn't think it was. You're exposed to music all the time, presumably, because your mother yeah. sings constantly. All the time. She never shuts up. <laughs> <laughs> Even now, I mean, she's got chronic COPD and asthma and God knows what else. But she, she sings all the time. She sings at three o'clock in the morning when she's going to the loo and she wakes me up. You know? <laughs> but she does. She, she hums, she sings snatches of everything, you know, traditional songs, musical, pop music, Billy Holiday, you know, she loves mm -hmm. all of it. The interesting thing for me is that, that you're seen as the, the, the keepers of the flame as far as English folk music is concerned, but your mother never just kept herself to the folk tradition, did she? She, she always sang whatever she felt like singing, pop songs or musical songs. Or she had a pop song <coughs> for George Formby songs at one time. She did? Yeah. She, uh, yeah, the, the, all of the Watersons were, were brought up. That's, that's my mum, her brother Mike and her sister Lal, and um, they were all of them brought up in the kind of family that, that did everything, and that because they were brought up by their Victorian grandmother, I think the whole thing sort of skipped a generation, really. Their, their grandmother brought them up. They were orphaned quite early on. My mum was about eight, nine years old when both of their parents died. My grandmother died uh, she, she died of an asthma attack in the winter of 1947, that very bad winter, when the ambulance couldn't get down the end of their road because it was all snowed in. And um, my grandfather uh, had a stroke about two weeks later, something like that, and he hung on for about 18 months, but he was bedridden from that point as well. And so they were brought up by their Victorian grandmother who did sing absolutely everything. She loved the kind of light opera stuff. She loved Joseph Locke. She loved uh, the kind of Erin's Green Isle sentimental things from a sort of Irish upbringing. Um, but she also loved musicals. She loved the spinning wheel. She loved everything. And all the cousins and the aunties and uncles were all around the house at the same time as well. There were there were different differing periods where various couples were living in with them as well. Their grandmother ended up buying them all a house each kind of thing. But there were periods where they were all in the house and uh, the uncle played the trumpet in the pit band for the silent orchestra for the for the uh, silent films. You know, mm. um, her father, my grandfather, used to uh, play jazz along to the American Forces radio on the banjo and the guitar. So they never really, there was never any restriction as to any sort of music in their house. It was a musical house, it was a storytelling house, and whether or not the music was traditional or whatever it was, there was a piano in the corner, one of the uncles used to step dance on the breadboard, you know. There was, <laughs> there were, and Hull at the time, I think, was, was naturally a very musical place as well. My mum, talks with great, uh, you know, with, with great affection about the, the sort of, the singing that used to go on in the pubs at the time, you know, everyone, everyone did sing all the time back then. Mm. And it really wasn't until the skiffle boom came along and they thought about being a skiffle group and then they thought, actually, what we need is our stuff. Where's our stuff? Where's the, if this stuff comes ultimately from American traditional music, then where's our traditional music? And it wasn't really until they were already <coughs> a musical group when they made that decision. Mm. They were, I think, and then, then I think they, they, they were called the Folksons for a while, mm. which is hilarious. And then 
um, after that, they, they, they became the Watersons after that, and that's when they started to specialise more in traditional music, to specialise more in the music of Yorkshire, in the seasonal songs and things like that. Music was never restricted in their house, and it was never restricted in ours either. I was always taught that music is a continuous line, it's a family, all kinds of music are a family. Every, every bit of it is related to every other bit. You can't put walls around stuff. You just can't. Well, you, I think it was your dad who said it, wasn't it? You, folk music's not a, a pickled gherkin. Yeah. You know, you don't just preserve something for the sake of it. It's impossible. I mean, even if you're trying to... So if you were to think now, or if a, if a for want of a better word, lay person was to think now, oh, think about folk music, you know, oh, it's a fiddle, and a, a, it's a fiddle and a banjo and a guitar and a flute. None of those things were in traditional music, you know, 200 years ago. None of them. 300 years ago, none of them. Music changes all the time. The one thing that impresses me as well, Eliza, is, is this working class family from the rainy, mucky back streets of all. <laughs> and if anybody's ever seen, has anybody ever seen that film that the BBC made in the 60s with the Watersons? It's called Travelling for a Living. Some of you have, some of you not. If you ever get the opportunity to see that film, just see it because it's a beautiful example of how a working class musical family decide to go on the road for, for a living. And if you look at some of the scenes in it, that, 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 your Auntie Lal, I always say she, she's like a Yorkshire Juliet Greco. She's got a poetic sensibility. She leads, reads lots of books about poetry. She's listening yeah. to all the she types of Rambo music. And, yeah, Absolutely. Very, yeah. So it's not just a, it's not just a family trying to keep hold of old songs. It's a family who are stretching out to encompass poetry and other songs from other forms. And art as well. My, yeah. my Auntie Lal was very was a very active artist who trained, yeah. she trained at uh, G.K. <coughs> Bueller's in Hull, which is a heraldic, um, a heraldic artist company. And they make, uh, they make, uh, what do you call them, it's for ships, you know, they make uh, insignias for, yeah, yeah. for ships and things like that. They're one of the few heraldic artists still left in this country and they get orders from all over the world. Yeah. She, she trained there, but she very, very quickly branched out into sort of quite dark and quite psychedelic art. Yeah. And there's a book out there called um, uh, called Teach Me to Be a Summer's Morning. If you're interested in in Lal's sort of artistic side as well as the songwriting and the the music that she was into, then that's a very beautiful book that you can look at. Mm -hmm. The uh, Traveling for a Living was made by Brian Shaw, and it was one of the very first uh, BBC documentaries about about a band, about uh, and especially about ordinary people it was one of the very first music documentaries made and you can actually watch it on youtube it is up it's on YouTube. a beautiful and film traveling yeah. for a living if you're interested it's very it's very interesting let's my mum's smoking and step dancing she she is. <laughs> <laughs> never with a fag out of her mouth honestly and they go down to uh, cecil sharp house and they've got these baker -like headphones on listening to people tumbling out the back of pub tap room singing, singing songs, that's where they're learning their, their, their songs. T talk about your school days. You went, to, you went to quite a posh school, didn't you? Um, originally I went to the, the, uh, the little primary school in, in the village. Well, Robin Hood's Bay and Filingthorpe are, are two villages sort of separated by the now decommissioned beaching railway line. Um, they're right next door to each other, but you wouldn't know if you spoke to any of the locals. It's like Robin Hood's Bay people don't go to Filingthorpe, and Filingthorpe people don't go to Robin Hood's Bay, you know. Because in Robin Hood's Bay they all stink of fish, and in, in, <laughs> they all stink of fish in Robin Hood's Bay, and uh, they're all farmers in Filingthorpe, you know. And there's like that much between them. But, uh, <laughs> but I went to the, so the school is sort of right in the middle of the two villages, and I, I went there. Um, when I was, when I was 10, I took an exam, I took the equivalent of an 11 plus exam and won a scholarship to a school called Hummonby Hall. I don't know yeah. if you remember that place. It went bust, uh, it went bust about four years later. Uh, but I, I, uh, I have very, very bad chronic asthma and the, the, I went as a day pupil, which was a big journey for me back then. We used to, I used to get the, the train from Scarborough every day. So we'd go the 15 miles to Scarborough get the train to Hunmanby and then walk um, two miles after that to get to the school and it was the same. I basically, I got to, I got to December and I just, 
I just collapsed, I had a big asthma attack. My parents were on tour in America at the time. And uh, we decided that I, I couldn't stay. So I went to Filing Hall, which is the, the school just above, just above the two villages. And uh, when you say it's posh, I mean, it is a, it is a boarding school, but it's, it's a boarding school for mainly, it's like army and RAF kids kind of thing. Lots of kids from Germany, lots of, um, uh, it's, it's a very rural school. It's, um, it's actually a lovely, it's a lovely place. I, I didn't appreciate it very much when I was there. I was very shy and I really loved school. I, I, I just, I loved learning, I loved history, I loved language, I loved music, all of them things. But I'd spent a lot of my early childhood in hospital and not really interacting. I lived on this little farm in this little musical bubble and our family was very different from the other families in the area. We weren't farmers or fishermen or Tories. Were they seen as good people or something? Very but, much Back so, to the land yeah. people. Yeah, they were living their self-sufficiency dream. You know, they were, they were very much growing everything and trying to learn which end of a sheep was which and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was, yeah, I, I, I didn't I didn't really fit in. Oddly, I, the wonders of social media, I actually get on with quite a lot of my friends from the Filing All day, Days these days. I, we all sort of reconnected about five years ago and there's some, uh, yeah, there's some real characters in there, but back in them days we didn't really mix well. So I spent a lot of time in my head, I spent a lot of time thinking about poetry and ballads and drawing pictures of unicorns and trying to avoid people <laughs> as much as possible. The, the, the school motto of the Highland <coughs> School is, is, is the days that make us happy make us wise. It's a, from a John Macefield poem. They're so, a lovely community actually. These days, Filing Hall is a, very, is a very nice school. It's a very small mm. school. Did it make you happy and wise? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, there, there were things about it that I liked. There were things about it that I liked, but I, most of my teenage years, it wasn't really until I started performing that I could deal with people at all. <laughs> I spent a lot of my childhood reading Homer and, and Shakespeare and things like that, and I, and I don't know. I, I, sometimes I think I wasn't really made for this world. Yeah. But I think a lot of performers find that. You find your voice and you find your confidence after you've been on stage for a while. I, started performing when I was 14, after I'd been at that school for a couple of years. And I was very miserable, and me and my friend in the village, me and, I had one best friend in the village, and we fell out. And my mum said to me, look, me and your auntie Lal and Mary have put a little singing group together, just the three of us, do you wanna come and join us on the road and come and sing some songs? And I said, yeah, and that was really the point at which I left the village and I didn't go back for nearly 20 years. Your mum once told me that the first inclination she had that you were becoming interested in being a performer or, or interested in what they were doing was she caught you reading a copy of The Child Balance and being well, excited about me the, reading it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but being excited about all the the, the kind of daring do and the, yeah. the, the, the poor the, the poor left women and the, the, the bold sailors and the, whatever else was in the channel. Yeah. The castles and the The castles and the and knocking the, down and the, yeah. the yeah. All that, yeah. I I think I got into it because I was I was trying to write books and at that time my dad, as I said, had started to rehearse at home more with Dave Swarbrick and he was singing the big ballads and he was also at the time going through a lot of wax cylinder recordings making his Rite of Passage album in 1987, 88. And um, I became interested in the epic nature of the ballads and I wanted to put them into prose. I had this idea that I could write books from them and then maybe plays or films. I was very interested in amateur dramatics and stuff like that and I, I wanted to to bring it to prose and I, and so I, I started working on I started working on Lord Bateman first I think um, and then I was working because I, I, I really 
I love the idea that it's that the story starts off in Turkey and this this there's this man who's been imprisoned and the Turkish the Turkish lords. Uh, daughter comes and sets him free and everything and then there's this epic journey he goes back to Northumberland and she follows him and she walks all the way through England she gets to Northumberland and knocks on his castle door you know and she stood there in all her finery and I loved all of that I loved the, the sort of cinematic nature of the ballads how yeah. big they were yeah. and I wanted to do that I wanted to put them into stories but then I started reading them and at the same time I had Dave Swarbrick playing the fiddle in my head at the same time, Chris Wood, the, the, the singer-songwriter now, but fiddle player back then, was coming to stay with us. I had a fiddle and I didn't know what to do with it. And he was singing and playing at the same time. And I thought that was really, really interesting. I'd never... We're, we're a singing family, we're not, an, we're not an instrumental family. I played classical piano, I'd had classical piano lessons. But I didn't know what to do with the fiddle because I didn't know anybody who played for Kayleys or I, there weren't sessions in our area, there weren't people playing instrumental music at all. So it wasn't really until Dad came back and I started to make the connections between Dave Swarbrick and Chris Wood and my dad and my mum that I thought, actually, here's maybe something I could get a handle on. And that was when my interest switched from prose to music, I think to the poetry and also to the instrumental part of it as well. But they are, I mean, as you'd said before, they are one and the same in, in, in a lot of respects. The, the words and the music and the history and the tradition, it all comes yeah. together. And then you make your first album, and I, I think you're only about 17 when you did your first album, were you? Yeah, well, the thing that really set me off, the thing that really got me going, was meeting Nancy Kerr, who was the same age as me. I think, because I was still really miserable at that point, I hadn't made a new friend. I'd, I'd tried to make a new friend in the village and that hadn't gone well either. We'd gone to, uh, she'd come on, on holiday with us when I was 15, 14, 15, and we'd gone to this, uh, these folk camps in America with my parents. And for some reason we fell out. We didn't, uh, and, and I just thought, that's it, I'm not having any friends anymore. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not doing that anymore. And when I came back, I spent quite a lot of time on my own. And my mum got talking to Sandra Kerr, and she said, Our Eliza's not doing very well. And she said, Well, because Nancy had been through some difficult times as well um, at home, with a, you know, and just and moving from London up to Northumberland, things like that. We were both sort of in a similar kind of a state. And Sandra said, well, let's get them together. And so they sent us on a, on a 16 year old play date. <laughs> Go and play with Nancy. And so I got to the house in, in, in Walkworth and, I, and I, I'd taken my mandolin with me. I didn't really play the fiddle very well or at all at that point, but I, I'd started listening to Bob Dylan and I thought I could maybe play the mandolin instead and I bought one of those, I bought a harmonica and one of them holders and I sat there with my holder <laughs> and the mandolin and she sat there with the fiddle just looking at me like that. And we sat, <laughs> we sat like that for, for about three hours looking at each other across Sandra's kitchen table and then it was like, do you want to do some songs then? And we just sort of pulled out various tune books and, and various song books and things like that. And we gradually started to play music together. I, at that point, we started hanging out together a bit more. We got, we were commissioned by Folkworks to support Chris Wood and Andy Cutting on their first um, art centre tour. That was the very, very beginning of the art centres. Up until that point, I'd never been outside of a folk club. I'd never been outside of a pub session or sitting in someone's living room, you know, sitting in rooms like this, listening to people singing ballads. Um, and they sort of threw us on the road with this little act. And then I started to see what it was that Nancy did. And she could sit on a stage like this and play for four hours for a Kaylee. She was the same age as me. She had silly coloured hair and big boots and, you know, and I just thought, there's someone like me. I'd grown up in rooms full of old people. I'd grown up in rooms full of old people and my parents' friends. I didn't know anyone my age that did music. I didn't know anyone at my age that, that played or sang or anything. So it was really Nancy's relationship that, that just gave me that extra push that I needed. 
and within 18 months we made our first album, that was 1993, we made an album called Shape of Scrape and it's very, it's, it's, it's got a real singularity of purpose, I mean I wasn't the best fiddle player in the world but we were bloody minded, you know, we had politics and we had ideas and we had, it's amazing how much that can carry you through, you know, I mean she was, she was a virtuoso. I don't know why she was hanging out with me, <laughs> I have no idea. But um, that was what did it for me, it was peers. It was peers, I, suddenly I had the family background and I had people to do it with, you know. But you very quickly realised, I think, Eliza, that y you could be your own woman as well because within a few years of that, you start experimenting with, with the tradition and with what, you, you're interested in because you bring an album out called Red Rice and that's as influenced by the rave culture and dance culture that was going about in the early 90s yeah. as, it is, as it is by the, in fact it's two halves of an album isn't it, one's a, one half is a folk half and the other half's got elements of it's crusty rave people in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny, uh, without getting too far into the definitions of folk and what's traditional and what isn't. That Red Rice was my second album. My first album was very influenced by the fact that I was, um, I was doing a lot of street theatre at the time. And the people that I was doing that with was uh, Taffy Thomas, the storyteller. Uh, his son, Sam Thomas, started a street theatre company called The Chippel Artists, and I was very involved with them. So I was very involved in circus stuff. If you open up the album, you'll see me balancing a fiddle on my chin. You know, we did a lot of, we did a folk club tour where we were, you know, we were sort of juggling and playing the drums and, and uh, unicycling around the folk club and stuff like that. And we sort of, we got into this sort of very rough kind of presentation of stuff out on the street. And I was like, if we can get people dancing out on the street, we can, there's got to be some way we can get them dancing in, venues as well we've got a, there's got to be a way to it was the rise at that time of of uh, things like the late night venues at the Bulverton in Sidmouth the um, Towersy Festival also uh, created a dance house and started having stuff that would go on till one o'clock in the morning stuff like that and there was a lot of world music kicking around lots of people like like the Barely Works for instance who were doing music that was very influenced by American stuff and loud and again I had the same reaction that my parents had it's like well if they can do that we can do that there was the pose as well there was a lot of very crusty stuff going on and I wasn't a crusty I wasn't like that I didn't want to be like that but I wanted to do something with different just with different values to get kids my age up and jumping I knew that we could do it on the street I knew that we could do it in a circus show um, so we had to be able to do it on the dance floor and then what happened is I went to Edinburgh and I saw what was going on in Scotland and what was going on in Scotland was Martin Bennett, Sugar Nifty, people like that, later on the Pete Bog Fairies but I saw a club mentality appearing in traditional music, a different way of presenting things, something that wasn't folk rock Forgive me if there are any fans in the room, but I cannot stand folk rock. <laughs> I don't like fair porn convention. I don't like <laughs> I just, I, it. I just, it just, right over my head. Partly actually, because my dad told me not to listen to it. He said, well, what he said was, don't listen to my peers or me. There are several of my dad's albums that I have never listened to. Really? Yeah. And I've still, to this day, never knowingly heard a Fairport Convention album. Never, like, I've got a lot of catching up to do, I know that. <laughs> but he told me to listen, he said, don't listen to my generation, go a generation back, go a generation before them, scoop up every oldie you can find, listen to those guys and make your own decisions. These are the decisions that we made with traditional music. My dad was one of the very first people to accompany a traditional ballad with an electric guitar. 
he was one of the very first people to do that and he was like the electric guitar he says that's that's 20 years old now it's 30 40 years old now you don't that's not your generation choose something else and what i found was a club culture and i was very i was blown blown away by the way that my generation wanted to represent their traditional music i found a different kind of community from the singers clubs and the folk clubs and things and i still love those things but i wanted to present something else it's like you get your you have your sunday afternoon you know your sunday evening sings but what do you do on saturday night you know what does my age do on saturday night i wanted to be out there i wanted to see clog dancers on top of the pops as <coughs> before and i mean it i still mean it I went on a top of the box doesn't exist anymore, but I wanted to see, I, I, just, I just wanted to see a real youth movement again. And I loved clubbing, I loved dancing, and I wanted to, to be able to do that, and then on a Sunday sit around and have a sing. I didn't see any difference between them, but what I was gonna say, people say about Red Rice, Red Rice is uh, an, an, al an album that people would think of as the folk rock or electronica um, sort of treatment of traditional music and then what they would think of as a traditional treatment of traditional music. The way I saw it, the, the acoustic album, the one with the fiddle and the guitar and the accordion, I thought, well, that's the way Kate Rusby does things. That's the modern approach. That's what my generation of folkies is representing <coughs> traditional music in a sort of quiet, nicey kind of respectful. acousti, acoustic-y, mm. respectful sort of a way. Mm. I saw the Electronica album as the real traditional music. Not because all the source material was the same. I got all the source material from the same places, but I saw the Electronica way of doing things as me serving the process. Absolutely. That's traditional. Yeah, yeah. That's what my generation is supposed to be doing. Yes. Because that is the continuity that is the cycle <laughs> and the leap forward reinventing at the same time. and the leap forward yeah. reinventing traditional music is what happens anyway with every generation yeah. you don't try and sit back and be all nice and nicey and acoustic mm. and oh look we play melodians because we've always played melodians right. i thought you know at the same time it, I, again i thought it was like saturday <coughs> night sunday morning there they are but i didn't see I didn't see the electric one as the modern no, approach and the acoustic one as the old approach. I saw it very much the other way around. But and it's a remarkable success is this Red Rice album because on an independent label you sold how many copies of that? Uh, today it's sold about 65, 70 odd thousand copies. 70 yeah. odd thousand copies. <laughs> And, the, and then, the, of course, when the, the major labels notice things like that. Yeah. And so you're approached by major labels in the aftermath of Red Rice, are you? Well, just, just the one, yeah. Tell us, tell us about it. Uh, well, it was um, the night of the Mercury Awards, because Red Rice was nominated for a Mercury in 1998. And... Um, and uh, Actually, it wasn't that night. I, I didn't know this, but, but there were scouts at the launch night of Red Rice, uh, which had been that May, I think it was in that May. And it's so funny because um, the head of A&R at Warner Brothers had to become a member of Islington Folk Club to come and see <laughs> <laughs> He paid his I was like, he paid his due. <laughs> he absolutely did. That made me very, very happy. But uh, but yeah, he was there that night, and then um, then they started talking to Topic Records about whether or not they'd be willing to let me go. And I got called in by Tony Engel from Topic Records, and he said he said two things. He says, well, there's Warner Brothers want want to sign you, and he said if this is going to happen, you're going to need a manager. With, uh, which was the point at which they introduced me to the man that would become a manager for the next sort of 10 or 15 years. Um, and he said, if you want to do this, we'll stand by you because they knew what it was that I wanted to do. I've always been very lucky in Topic Records. It's the oldest independent label in the world. They're about to, separate, to celebrate their 80th birthday next year. 
along with my mum. Same, same year as your mum. Same yeah, year yeah. as my mum, 1939. <coughs> the Man Who Watches the Worker's Beer was their first song. It was. I've been a nerd now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oldest independent label in the world, and we've always had a similar approach to things. Tony Engel was always about supporting their archives, always about supporting their field materials. This was before they brought out the Seminal Voice of the People series, and they saw me as a flagship artist, not just as a commercial record label, but also for their, you know, for their, for their wider kind of left-wing agenda, if you like, of, of, of spreading the news about, about traditional music. And that's what I was all about. It was all in the service of traditional music for me. And they said, Look, if you want to do this, we'll support you. And they, they, they helped me get a manager and all that. And we had lots and lots of conversations. And then on the, eve, on the uh, evening of the Mercury Awards in 1998, Andrew Wickham came up to me with with a group of <laughs> with a group of suits and said, "How about it?" We had a we had a meeting. And we talked and talked and talked and we talked about my agenda. We talked about traditional music and we talked about everything. And I decided to sign to a major label, not to make traditional music, but to write my own songs. And so I did. <laughs> but were you thinking? It, 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 it's interesting that they come up to you on the very night that you're celebrating success as a folk artist. Are they suggesting to you at all that you, they want you to be a pop singer? Or what, what, what are they saying? Andrew Wickham is a really interesting character. He was the youngest ever executive um, in the A&R department at Warner's. He had his own office in Burbank when he was... 20. He's the man that discovered the Grateful Dead. He's the man that discovered Joni Mitchell, Ry Kuna. Um, he's the man that famously fell asleep. <laughs> famously fell asleep during Jackson Brown's first audition. <laughs> <laughs> because the Grateful Dead were very, very fond of uh, Andrew was a he was a very interesting looking fella. He was about he was about five foot six, five foot seven little curtains hairdo like that and he, and he always wore tweed suits and a little bow tie like that and he never the whole time he was the whole time he was at Warner's he never changed his look never changed his his specky little ways he was a great bloke and the Grateful Dead used to delight in spiking him and leaving him places really? yeah <laughs> the night of the Grateful Dead played Madison Square Garden <laughs> They spiked him and left him somewhere. I can't remember where they left him, but it's a very famous story. That... Anyway, he wakes up in the middle of nowhere going, what? Yeah. And thinks, I've got a meeting at nine o'clock in Burbank. Now, fortunately, he's going back in time, so he's got more time. But he managed to get himself to his Burbank office for his nine o'clock audition. Anyway, he sat there like <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'm not sure what it was that they'd given him, but it was all a bit fuzzy around the edges, you know. And, uh, and he sat there, and this um, sort of very willowy young man comes in with a guitar and starts singing this very soporific, you know, 60s, <laughs> 60s acoustic singer-songwriter sing yeah. nonsense. And, uh, and uh, yeah, gets to the end of his very, very serious song yeah. and looks up and he's <laughs> just like, <laughs> has to sleep at his desk. <laughs> that was Jackson Brown's first audition for, uh, for, <laughs> for Warners. But he was, a, he was a very, very interesting man. And he came from the period in time when Warners nurtured artists. He was very, very proud of the fact that they had nurtured Ry Cooder. He was very, very proud of the fact that they had nurtured Joni Mitchell. And what he said to me was, that's what I want to do with you. He says, I see you as a cross between, he says, I see you singing traditional music. He says, I love that. We're not selling that. We're not going to do that. He says, there's a couple of things that you do that I think could work. He said, but we are interested in the fact, because I was already writing songs by that point, and there are on all of my, on, on all of my albums up to that point. 
there were songs here and there. I had loads of stuff written, you know. And he said, I could really see you developing into something of a cross between Joni Mitchell and Judy Garland. And he had this. He said, did he really say that? Yes, he really did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A cross between Judy Mitchell, <laughs> Joni Mitchell and Judy Garland. Judy okay. Mitchell. Joni Garland. <laughs> um, Good the name, that Joni Garland. Joni Garland. <laughs> and the, problem, the problem was that by the time he got to me, time had got to Warner's, and so had AOL. And Warner's was being systematically ripped apart by, at that point. And they weren't interested in nurturing people anymore. They weren't interested in doing what they'd done with David Geffen, for instance, which was, which was bringing up this sort of young executive to the point where he was so confident that he could go off and form Geffen, Re Geffen Records. No harm done, you know. They wanted good relationships, but they didn't have the infrastructure. You would never speak to the same person twice. He was always in America. Yeah. His assistants were I don't know what the word is. Attack dogs. It's probably yeah. they were just robotic computer says no yeah. people who were really watching their backs. People who were all about to lose their jobs and they knew it. And had learned how to nurture in the same way. No well they if they had they they'd abandoned it. it yeah. If they had they'd abandoned it. Okay. And I went out, I made, I made the record for them. We lived in Brighton for six months and they took me off the road. I'd gone from playing to full houses all over the country. The Red Rice band did very, very well. The Red, the Red Rice, the album itself was doing very, very well. And I went from playing full houses all over the country to in the space of about 18 months, playing to almost nobody or not playing at all. And I lived in Brighton for six months and we had nothing. Every time I bought a pint of milk, it cost me three quid in, in uh, well, eight quid in overdraft charges, you know. I was living in, living in this ridiculous apartment, couldn't buy me dinner. We were going to <clears throat> Metway Studios every day. The levellers were having a refit in their studios and they'd let us use this place for, for the duration. And we had nothing and the band, ripped itself apart, we fought constantly. The producer, Al Scott, who'd made Level in the Land, had been told that I was difficult. No, for no reason. We hadn't had any crosswords, nothing at all. As far as I was concerned, me and Andrew Wickham were getting on great. But they were told to, he was told to watch me that I was a difficult artist, that I would be stroppy, and I was in no account to be allowed to make any artistic decisions. He was given the purse strings, he, he gave all of the songs to Van Dyke Parks' bass player in Paris, and they re recorded every single one of Barnaby Stradling's parts with this bass player in Paris, I can't remember his name now. Um, they s there was just no, every time you phoned the office you spoke to a different person, there was none of the, the relationship that I'd had with Tony Engel at Topic was that we had made all the commercial decisions around my first album, I'd gone to him and I'd said, I want a band, I don't want to play in folk clubs, I don't want my picture taken on the side of a hill holding my violin looking out into the distance, you know. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't make me sit on any hay bales, you know. I want to, <coughs> I, I want to open up new stages, new places for young people to play. And in order to do that, we're going to do this differently. And Tony went, right, let's do it. And we had, we had artistic and commercial conversations. With Warners, there was none of that. They changed, like we had, we agreed with the, with the designer how the album was going to look. Five designers later, it, the, the, the sleeve 
it's like a it's like somebody's taken the original idea and put it through a prism or something it's 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 so distorted the album itself the music itself i'm actually very very proud of we managed to make a uh, we managed to make a a very good record but it was like pulling teeth when we got to the states when we got to the states we went on the road it was good work I went on Conan O'Brien and I talked about English traditional music on Conan O'Brien, you know, to 25 million people. And that's why I was there, you know. Yeah. But life was just hell otherwise. I mean, I could see all of this. And the one thing it did do, Eliza, it was, it, it made you famous mm -hmm. in that sense. You became very famous around that time. And then lots of other people want to collaborate with you. Yeah, that's true. So we get Billy Bragg coming to see you, we get Paul Weller coming to see you, Jules Allen wants you on his Well, his actually, show. Billy Bragg, he yeah. had, I, I, my very first tour with the band was with, with, was with Billy Bragg. Yeah. Yeah, in 1995. Yeah. So that's five, six years previous to that. But yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah this is when people did start to... And what do they see you as? I mean, Billy, Paul Weller, people like that, Jules Allen, do, do the... Do they see you as the folk princess who was going <laughs> to give them a bit of cachet because they've captured you? Like you'd in a to, ballad? You'd have, you'd have to ask them that. I often find, because, because, I'm, because I'm visible, people think, well get that folk girl in, you know. And then they get me in and they feel all naughty. Like Billy's, like Billy's producer, Grant Showbiz, when he first when he got me in on Billy's album, I can't remember, I think it was England and Half English they got me in on. And he said, I'm going to tell your mum and dad that we made you play on a record with drums. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you have no idea what it is that I do, do you? <laughs> you have no idea why I'm here. Why are you here? <laughs> um, I think, yeah, it's funny. I remember when More Chiba, does anybody remember More Chiba? Yeah. Remember More Chiba had that uh, part of the process record. This is how I think producers think about folk people. Oh, we're gonna get a folk person on. And More Chiba had that record, part of the process, and they got that wonderful Cajun fiddle player on, Jean Calquier Genet? I don't know, I can't remember his name. I can't remember his name, anyway. Um, they got him on the record and it's, it's this great, beautifully, pristinely produced folk song. And then in the middle of it, there's this awful bit of out of tune fiddle. Like it's awful. But it's sort of cajun -y style and I imagine them all sat there and I imagine him sitting there going, are you sure that's all right? And him going, oh no man, that's folk as all hell. Oh yeah, yeah, that's the grit that we need, you know. I've had that like, when I, was, when I was pregnant with our, uh, with our Florence, I lost my voice. And I was on a record with uh, Patrick Wolf. I couldn't speak at the time. I, my voice did this thing where it fractured into about five different tones. And, it was, and I sounded like, like Barry White through a vocal or something. It was ridiculous. And he was like, oh, that's great. That's great, you'll sing on this one. And if you ever buy his album, The Bachelor, you can hear me, and it just sounds like, it sounds like another person. Mm. But it's just like, oh, here comes the grit. This is our, if you like, our authenticity, all right? It's, it's kind of like what you're saying, but they don't, a lot of them don't know why you're there. And what you can do. Yeah. It's like, I, I, now I love Jules Holland, and I love the album that I was on, but the track that he got me to sing, it was all these and thous and it's sweet if you like, it was called. And it's very sweet, and it's, it's fine. But I spent my life taking all of these and thous out of the songs that I, that, out of the songs that I research, modernising them. They see me and, it, oh, there's that lass that sings the old stuff. Let's, here's, a, here's a thing with all these and thous in it. Let's get Liza Carthy in, you know. Yeah. Here's a thing, here's a, here's a thing about, about bosoms and flowery dresses. Let's get Liza Carthy in, you know. And I was trying to be a punk. <coughs> and I didn't, you know. So to a certain extent, yeah, being, a, 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 being the most visible part of a pyramid, if you like, is, yeah, it's, it, it, can be, it can be weird. But when it works, when it works, it's brilliant. And, and I love collaborating. I absolutely love it. 
I love getting to play with with Cora players from Mali. I love getting to play with people like Bill Frizzell, you know. I love I love the fact that I went out I went out to Ghana. Hugh Masakela gave me his card and went, "If you ever need a trumpet player, look. Yeah, yeah. you know." I love that. I love I love singing with Chango Spasio from Argentina, you know, or standing on stage standing on stage with a reggae band, or just or, de or you know working with DJs, working with with beatboxers, working with. Uh, I worked with this woman called Eva Bitterba from from um, the Czech Republic, and I'm singing a traditional song, and she's making bird noises over the top, you know, and and playing classical violin. And I love the fact that these things can stand side by side with each other. I love putting them next to each other and seeing what happens. I love. I've got this thing called the Generations Project, which is about people that come from traditional music backgrounds working with each other. And Eva, Eva is, is one of them. Her father was, a, um, her father was an ethnomusicologist. And her mother sang in one of those, uh, those state-organized choirs, yeah. you know. Um, so one of those Czech kind of, uh, let's sing songs about our country kind of thing. And then I worked with this last uh, Martha Mavroidi from Greece. Her father was also in uh, Maro Duranti from Puglia. His father started the band that he's in now in 1917 and handed the band over to him. Now it's your turn, so <laughs> kind of thing. I worked with a punk cellist from Vienna. Her father, her father never played a note in his life, but he was an ethnomusicologist known for bringing folk music back to the young people of Austria after the Second World War. And she's a punk, and she plays like punk folk music with her sister. And I love, I love making connections. I love seeing, I love seeing the joins. I'm not one of these people that that, that goes, this is my thing, you know, and, and, and it's just the we're unique and we're over here kind of thing. I just, I want to know where we're all the same. That's, that's where I come from with, with, with collaborations. I think it's really important. I have this thing that every, everywhere is local. Yeah. People accuse me of parochialism all the time. You know, you're very locally, very local. Yeah, but everywhere is local, isn't it? Everybody right. comes from somewhere. And it's just a matter of finding out what their local interests are. Exactly. So you, you, you've just said you love this, you love that, you love it. What don't, you, I mean, it must get on your nerves sometimes when they just want the folk element, yeah. as, as they often do. With you, I mean, yeah. you're the go-to folk person, <laughs> aren't you, Liza? Let's be fair. Be rough, love. You know? <laughs> Is that what you think that they think, or? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah? Really? Sometimes, or yeah. I mean, with funnily enough, with Joan Byers, it was almost exactly the opposite, because Joan Byers had absolutely no idea who I was. I, I toured with Joan Byers on and off for about a year. We were about well, I mean, we were involved with each other for about a year. It was, uh, we toured for three and a half months in the States and uh, for about three weeks over here. And she had no idea what it was that I did. I was put up for it by, by the management, uh, her management liked the idea of it. They knew who I was in theory, but they didn't know, for instance, that I self-accompanied on the violin. So we get into a thing where she's got this co-mentoring thing that she calls it, she calls it. So she has you in her band and then she will come on stage during your support set and kind of sing along in the background and stuff like that. She'll do backing vocals for you. She's, it's all very, you know, it looks good on paper, you know. But when it came to what it is that I actually do, she was like, can't you just play a solo and just show up for the rest of the time? <laughs> and I'm like, well, no, I'm not a session musician. I'm a specialist. Why am I here? You know, I, I, she's, you've got a violin player. If you want me in the band, and of course I was, I was 20 and I didn't have the, I was 25 and I didn't have the courage to say that. I would say it now, but I was like, okay, so you just want me to play one note all the way through these lines and then you want me to play a solo, which by the way, I have no idea how to do. I don't play solos, I play accompaniments. You know, I was a complete mismatch for Joan Byers. It did not work. And I have to say, I disliked most of my time with her because she had no idea. She had no idea. 
I would show a come on uh, to accompany somebody with, with a dance that came before the festival. <laughs> I can't remember what band it was now, but she, she, she suddenly just came, she just suddenly came on dancing. <laughs> yeah. Doing yeah. That that's what she dancing. does, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. what she does, yeah. <laughs> she wasn't invited, I don't think. She didn't look as though she'd been invited. Well, She's I'm a just, woman. I'm just looking at, we've been talking for over an hour. Oh, God. It, it's time's gone. I just, we've got to 2002. We, we, there's, there's a couple of things we want to do. Um, something very special is happening next year because it, it's a mum's 80th birthday. I want to talk a little bit about that. I want a tune from the fiddle, if, if you wouldn't mind, and I'm oh, sure that they do. Yeah. And is there anything that you'd, anybody would like to ask from the audience? You've told us a lot of people you don't want to work with. Who is Have I? you would like to work with? <laughs> <laughs> uh, who would I like to work with? I've, I've been very lucky in that I've worked with some amazing people. You know, Benjamin Zephaniah and... Mm. Oh... Lynn Crazy Johnson and all sorts of people. Ooh, who would I like to that I haven't yet? <laughs> um, gosh, Blackwell. what's that? Nigel Blackwell. <laughs> There's always Nigel Blackwell. Of course it's happening, you know, he just uh, periodically announces that we're going to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, I am a big, big fan of Half Man, Half Biscuit, so uh, yeah. I'm, I'm making do with the bar steward sons of Aldean at the moment. <laughs> They're good. Have you well, ever seen the it? best thing to come yeah. out of Barnsley since the A61 to Sheffield? Because yeah, that's yeah. what Jarvis said. <laughs> They're very funny. Oh, I love yeah. they'll be at Norma Fest. Yeah. Um, though there are so many people that I would that I would love to work with, I can't even. I'd like to revisit a lot of the people that, I, that I've worked with before. Um, oh God, I'd like the Imagine Village to do more. So I'd like to work with them. What was Weller like? You worked with Paul. I did work with Weller. He's, he's, he's lovely. Yeah. He's quite shy to start with, but then he's, he kind of warms up. Yeah. And I have to say, I was never a massive fan before we worked together. But when I got into the studio and I put the headphones on and his voice came in through the headphones, I went, oh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> he's very respectful of English music as well. Oh, he's, he's uh, with... isn't Dad on his new album, I think. Uh, he might be. I think he is, actually, yeah. 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 Another question. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting. Your uh, it's slightly esoteric point, I think, but I loved what you were saying about Sidmouth and the way it was heading towards a kind of almost rave sensibility. Yeah. At that point, and there was a sort of tipping point. I felt so. I used to play in a band that used to share bills with Sam and Barnaby. I used to know them. And we used to play at Sidmouth. And at that point, the late nineties, I remember feeling it was getting to that one o'clock thing. Yeah. That it really was linking with the rave process. Definitely, yeah. And when I was first went out raving, so I didn't massively influenced by your parents and the huge awesome fan scene in the 70s and everything, but when I went out, went out raving, my key thing was I thought this is the folk process. When I heard that Ride on Time song being used in about 20 different songs, I thought this is like the trees that do grow high, like 150 different versions. And I wondered if you felt that as that generation, whether you felt that the rave process was that. It was a new tradition. I really did, and I, I was very... I, I really wanted to create places for that to happen in the folk scene because I felt all these people were making music for themselves. People that had been divorced from instruments, you know, there was a whole period in the, in the sort of late 80s where it's like people weren't playing anything, nobody had anything for themselves in a way. I, I just felt like when people started making, making hard techno in their basements, I was like, I want, I want part of that because this is folk music, this is what, you know, it's like when, when my dad always talks about punk, when punk happened and the punks were kept out of the folk clubs, my dad reckons that was one of the biggest mistakes that the folk scene ever made because you're talking about people making music for themselves, for their communities and what is that if not folk music? And I felt that at that time that the folk scene, for whatever reasons, and I'm not looking down on the folk scene by any means, but for whatever reasons, the folk scene was not fitted up to allow that kind of thing to happen. And I felt bereft. That's why I wanted to reach out. Gatekeepers. One of the most astonishing things I ever heard a mother and father talking about was the Sex Pistols appearance on top of the pops when they did Pretty Vacant that time. And a, and a mum and dad saw it, and, and a mum said to her dad, I think there's something happening. <laughs> yeah. I really admire the way you, you, you take the, the tradition that you've been seeped in, 
and, and do different things with it, I really do. But one, one track that I really like, and I will like, uh, is um, Whispers of Summer, oh, yeah. Names and Cigarettes, which kind of like goes down almost the poppy route. Yeah. Have you ever thought of exploring that a bit further? Well, the whole of the Angels and Cigarettes yeah. album was my attempt to do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that track in particular, you know, people latched onto. And... It's true. But that, that, that particular arrangement was much lighter than I intended it to be as right. well. When I wrote that track, I wrote it in Philadelphia on a, on a tenor guitar that I'd, just, that I'd just bought and it was all to do with the resonances of the guitar. Yeah. When, I brought it, when I brought it to the producer, it was like, right, that's a pop song and made a pop arrangement of it. And I do, and I, and I like it. It's it's a lot yeah. less sad than I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. People that I've played it to that aren't don't particularly like folk or yeah, yeah. Like to oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, I have made two pop records since then. There's, um, I, the, it all gets very, I suppose it gets very kind of acoustic-y, cabaret -y kind of thing when you get to Neptune, which is another album of of um, contemporary songs, all contemporary contemporary songs, um, and then. I've just made another contemporary album, which will be out. Uh, it's coming out in about six months. Called uh, <laughs> it's called Cupid is as stupid does, <laughs> and that comes out. <laughs> that's going to come out in about six. You months. heard it here first. Eh? <laughs> that, that that lineup, that lineup is again. It's it's kind of esoteric. It's not pop pop as such. I think I'm possibly a bit long in the tooth for pop these days, to be honest. But you like, like to go back to traditional as well because not long after I'm right in thinking engines to get Susanna Carna. Yeah. And that, that's sort of like, you know, hard back to what you've been brought up with. Well, absolutely. But I also, I brought out two Waters and Carthy albums at yeah. the time that I was with yeah. Warners as well. So yeah. I tried to never let the traditional side of things go, no. you know, just to try and keep that cycle, that continuity going. But I mean, that's where you draw, through your more sort of um, experimental work, that's where you draw new people into in, into what's the tradition. Hopefully, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you'd be surprised as well by how many people are just struck by the tradition. You stand up and sing an unaccompanied song, and people go, "What the? Yeah, fuck is that? You know?" And that can bring people in. I mean, my dad was seventeen years old the first time he saw a real traditional singer. He didn't need it dressed up with anything. I think sometimes, sometimes you, you know, people underestimate young people. You yeah. know. Yeah. But there are there are so many ways you can do it. There are so many ways. I just I'm I'm a pie eater. That's my problem. I want I just I just want to try everything. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Let's let's tell them what you're going to do next year because your mum is 80. We've come full circle in oh, this yeah. in this. We start with your mum and we end with your mum. She's 80 next year and there's a very special festival going to take place. There is. Uh, for the last four years, we've been running a non-profit festival in our area called Norma Fest. And the reason that we do this is that um, some of you will be aware, some of you might not be, that my mum is very infirm these days. She doesn't travel well. She does still like to sing. So what Norma Fest does is it provides her a stage on which to do that without her having to travel. Now, we usually do it in winter. We usually do it second second weekend in January because that's the quietest weekend of the year in Robin Hood's Bay. <laughs> and, so it means we can get hotel rooms, basically. <laughs> but uh, also, it's sort of been, become part of our, uh, our kind of family Christmas celebrations. However, this year, it being my mum's 80th, um, the Marquis of Normanby has offered us his castle just north, <laughs> north of Whitby. <laughs> to throw a festival the last weekend in June. It's called Elephant at the Castle. The reason is because um, Mulgrave Castle, just outside Whitby, uh, was known for um, a very famous Indian visitor <coughs> called uh, the Maharaja Duleep Singh came to stay at Mulgrave Castle for quite some time and he had elephants. And there were elephants on Sands End Beach 150 years ago, which is just brilliant to think about. Apparently the road at Sands End was built so they wouldn't get sand in between their toes as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, yes, the, the Music Port Festival and Norma Fest are getting together to put on a proper main stage and big top and open air stage festival last weekend in June, and it's going to be big. We're doing a concert for my mum. We, we've got a few... Uh, major kind of name acts come in. We've also got a birthday party for her, which we're hoping is going to be a multi-artist event. Um, 
We've got a Rajasthani circus turning up and a giant animatronic elephant. Oh. <laughs> but mostly it's about mostly it's about giving baking my mum a big musical cake. It's going to be basically everything that she loves from from, uh, from, from 80 years of her life. From 80 years of her life, it's going to be calypso music. There's going to be gypsy singers. There's going to be um, second generation in immigrant musicians. There's going to be uh, people from all. <laughs> <laughs> it's honestly, it's going to be amazing. So We've had, there's been four festivals so far, um, and, and Ian's been a big part of every I've, one of them. So I, I have. I've, I've enjoyed every one. They've been brilliant, and and it's just. It's like seeing Norma in, 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 a, fr in a front row, really. The, the whole staging of it is like bringing it to a house. Anyhow, enough. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's have a bit of fiddle playing because we've got to finish in, in four minutes. Uh, I'll sing you this one because uh, we've been talking about how the family always loves stuff from everywhere. This is, uh, this is a song that, well, it's a song that comes from Tin Pan Alley.
Um, I didn't expect it to be anything less than, than elegant. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure you all didn't. And uh, it was a very relaxing and gentle way to spend a, a Saturday lunch time, I think. So uh, just a bit more applause for Eli. <laughs> Thank you for coming.